Okay, um, so the title of my presentation, um, as you can see, is Augmented Materiality, Mediated Space in um, Laos Carax's Holy Motors. Um, so I was going to cover quite a lot of theoretical approaches to the city, but um, since we've already heard some of those, I'm going to sort of skip over some of that and focus a little bit more on my um, film analysis. So hopefully that's going to be entertaining, if not quite as rigorous. Um, so here goes. Rapid developments in mobile technology and wireless connectivity have profoundly affected the relationship between virtual and material space. Rather than offering a virtual world or cyberspace into which we, one can escape from the material world, Mike Featherstone argues that ubiquitous media are, quote, increasingly embedded in material objects and environments. We are increasingly tied to smart technologies, such as mobile phones and tablets, which act as interfaces between physical and virtual levels of experience and mental involvement. We are therefore able to partially inhabit multiple spaces simultaneously, distributing our attention between virtual worlds and our material surroundings. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this kind of image or see this on your usage of public transport around the world. As content can now be viewed on the go with tablets and ever bigger smartphones, users jump back and forth between different cinematic, televisual and online spaces. This notion of a fluid movement between and even co-presence in hybrid virtual and material spaces con contrasts strongly with earlier descriptions of cyberspace, especially from the 1990s, which Scott Buchatman describes as, quote, a new and decentered spatiality that exists parallel to but outside of the geog geographic topography of experiential reality. Um, so my PhD thesis examines the shift or evolution from virtual to augmented reality through the rather unconventional lens of contemporary global cinema. Um, so I'm going to give just a little bit of an overview of my PhD thesis really, really briefly um, so you can kind of understand the larger project that this um, section comes from. Um, so in my PhD thesis, I argue that various examples of recent contemporary cinema from around the world work to layer mediated modes of perception over diegetic worlds. So I analyse how these films employ aesthetic qualities, including colour, music and graphics, to layer levels of mediation over and within on-screen material space. So these films are inherently intermedial in the sense that they weave the ontological and spatiotemporal logics and or aesthetics of other media into the fabrics of their diegetic worlds. I suggest that this approach contrasts strongly to earlier films explicitly about technology and mediated worlds such as Tron or even The Matrix, which structured their spatial relationships around the notion of an immaterial cyberspace that exists alongside the real world on screen but remains separate to it. Um, so you can see in Tron it's kind of a world made entirely of sort of digital grids and very much the kind of digital outline of it. My thesis posits that this shift reflects, or at least is concurrent to, the altered relationship between the virtual and the real implied by mobile ubiquitous media. So my paper today is based on the opening chapter of my thesis, which examines the relationship between urban space and mediation, focusing upon three films, Laos Carax's Holy Motors, Matteo Garon's Reality, and Sofia Coppola's The Bling Ring. I argue in my chapter that the examples discussed invoke various mediated modes of organising, representing and perceiving space from the cinematic gaze to reality television surveillance camera and reality to the digital map in the bling ring and layer these mediated modes over concrete on-screen spaces. In this sense, modes for imagining and perceiving space unite with the ground level view of space. Um, for the purposes of time today, I'm only going to use the single representative example of Holy Motors so that I can go into some depth on it. Um, and I'm going to try to convince you that the film depicts the styles, genres and tropes of cinema and other media as prosthetic layers of mediation that inhabit and augment spatial zones within the city of Paris. So in order to situate this analysis in its broader conceptual context, I'm going to very briefly explore the complex theoretical lineage of connections between media and urban space, um, and then present my own reading of Holy Motors relating the formal qualities to the spatiotemporal logics of ubiquitous media. Um, so not to repeat what we've just heard, um, but I'd like you to just keep in mind um, that film has always held a really close affinity with, set, with city spaces. And as we've heard, we move from Benjamin, who suggested that the kind of formal principles of film, its montage and its kind of shot 
aesthetics and the sensory experience reflected city life and city experience. We moved from that concept to Baudrillard in the 1980s who suggested that we actually need to start with the screen and how the, 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 city, um, the city is reflecting uh, the cinema rather than the cinema reflecting the city. Um, so Scott McGuire um, has kind of elaborated on this concept um, when he describes the media city. Um, so he kind of extends these connections between cinema and the city, but it's just one part of his larger analysis of the relationship between city spaces and media. Um, he suggests that the contemporary city can be viewed as a media architecture complex, defined by, quote, the proliferation of spatialized media platforms. So he argues that it's the culmination of a long line of developments where each new media form to be introduced, from photographs to cinema to digital screens to ubiquitous media, has articulated, quote, distinct instantiations of modern urban space. So he talks about fragmented cinematic montage and its links with the characteristics of industrialized urban life. Um, but later he turns his attention to glass houses and he talks about changing notions of private space enabled by different media that kind of allow us into other people's lives and how that's then reflected in kind of architecture and designs of the city. Um, so his core point is that in all cases, new media forms don't simply represent urban space, but they actively alter the way that urban space is perceived and imagined. So the films that I examine in my thesis extend this notion of spatialized media forms, with Holy Motors going, even going so far as to organize various genres as spatial zones through which the protagonist travels via car. Okay. So with increasingly portable media, especially now ubiquitous smartphones, as well as the development of QR codes that enable material objects to be tagged with links to digital content, mediated experiences are no longer physically confined to particular spaces and locations, but rather take place in a diverse range of places within the physical world. So I'll argue that Holy Motors explores this migration of cinema as a synecdoche for media more generally, from what Scott McQuire describes as specialised sites, i.e. sites that are, are purposefully there for engaging with media, um, into the wider world. So, in the film, Denis Levant plays an actor um, who travels in a limousine driven by a sage female chauffeur between appointments around the city of Paris. He plays a variety of roles in various encounters with different characters in different settings. Um, you can see him here as a kind of dying man in a classic death scene um, and also memorably as a slightly odd, decrepit tramp. Um, just in Leos Carrick's, oh sorry, um, the limousine travels through a city in which a different media or cinematic mode defines each new spatialized destination in each engagement. So each engagement appears to represent a type of film or a type of media. Leia's Carrick thus constructs a cinematic city that layers a number of different modes and forms onto decaying physical spaces in Paris, like a prosthetic enhancement, just as the actor Oscar dons various costumes and prosthetics, and just as ubiquitous media allow us to add an additional and removable mediated layer of virtual experience to stable physical spaces. In one sequence, for example, Oscar, dressed as a mute and deformed tramp, disrupts a fashion shoot in the park, starring the glamorous Eva Mendes, and the sequence becomes defined by the poles of glamour and oddity that gives fashion photography its peculiar eccentricity. So the sequence seems to represent the kind of conventions of fashion photography. In another, particularly memorable sequence, um, which I'm not going to talk about today, but is absolutely gorgeous and I could talk about to the hills. Um, Oscar performs a motion capture love scene that is as much ballet as cinema in a striking suit covered with brightly lit senses, where the physical presence of the actors is literally intertwined with a mediated view or mode. Other sequences resemble climactic moments from films or kind of generic tropes, such as the death scene or action showdown. Cinema is no longer just at the theatre on a screen, but rather media are imagined as spatial zones and mediated prosthetic modes are layered over the crumbling city. Physical movement thus becomes a significant metaphor in Holy Motors. Alan Cameron and Richard Mizek have written of the way in which transport metaphors work in intelligent blockbusters, such as Inception and Source Code, to promote ambiguity between technological and psychological movement. These films, quote, revolve 
around a notion of transport that brings together psychology, movement, and mediation, unquote. The characters are transported through a physical space and mental space simultaneously, thus spatializing the idea of media transport. In Holy Motors, movement across a city of cinematic moments comments on the proliferation of spaces of reception and the way in which cameras and other media are increasingly embedded in our material environments to the point that they become invisible. In order to do this, the film juxtaposes two different modes of transport. So the film's opening sequence invokes the image of a ship, associating this older and inherently collective mode of transport with the experience of viewing a film in the cinema. In the opening sequence, we see a decaying 16 millimeter piece of black and white film. Um, so this is, and it's depicting an exercising naked man. So it clearly looks like an actuality, um, it's kind of referencing the long history of cinema exhibition. We then see the audience sitting motionless and stationary in the dark, but traffic sounds can be heard in the background. As the audience continues to watch, the film appears to switch to a modern action film as we hear a man yelling and the sounds of a fight. Then, as if to announce a traversal from the world of the film into some undefined backstage area behind the screen, we hear a ship's foghorn. And this sound is much like the sound we would hear if a ship were approaching land, thus equating a journey over physical sea with the journey on which a film takes its audience. Carax then cuts to a sleeper. This is where it gets a bit complicated and convoluted. I wish I had time to show the clip, but I don't. Um, played by himself, who's lying on a bed, also accompanied by ship sounds of seagulls and lapping waves. It's almost as if he's in a cabin below deck. He arises and wanders over to the window where he looks out at the city, but the soundtrack continues to play the incongruous ship sounds. He then walks over to a wall and feels the surface until he eventually comes across a keyhole. The sleeper's finger is revealed to be a metal key, which he uses to unlock the wall, and then when he unlocks the wall, there's an open door which allows him to go through into the cinema where we've seen the people watching. So as Carax walks through the projection booth and opens the door to the cinema itself, the sounds of the sea increase in volume and it is revealed that the screen is filled with an image of the sea. He stands above the audience, as you can see here, with the camera placed behind and slightly above him. And as he looks down upon the seated audience from the balcony, he is now accompanied by loud sounds of seagulls and waves. Um, so this still didn't kind of capture it the best, but um, the image visually and orally resembles a person standing on a ship's deck, kind of looking out at a sea of people. In this way, Carax forms an association with ships in the cinema or the space of the cinema. So ship travel implies a journey, just as cinema does, but it's also a journey that's slower and outmoded. Our ship passage has been largely replaced by commercial air travel. In this way, the now old-fashioned experience of viewing a film in a specific place and with others in the dark becomes linked to an older form of transport. So if the film juxtaposes the ship with another mode of transport, that mode of transport is more flexible and individualized car trips. So, if I can get my PowerPoint to work. There we go. Unlike a ship where one is a passive passenger and can preserve the illusion of remaining stationary even while traveling, driving a car implies a degree of self-direction and agency. One can diverge from a set path with a car, whilst the ship generally follows a straight line with only scheduled stops. Similarly, the cinematic experience is physically passive, stationary, fixed, and offers little choice of location, whereas mobile and portable media allow one to choose when and where to engage with media, for better or for worse. Furthermore, the ship is an inherently collective form of transport. You know, you don't usually take a ship with just you across the world. Similar to viewing a film in a theatre. The car, on the other hand, is a much smaller unit, and according to Thomas Lamar, entails monadic isolation. So this means it kind of encloses the driver in an interior even as they're traveling around. The car has consequently been compared to personal media devices that allow us to enjoy private media experiences in public <coughs> places. David Morley, for example, discusses the mediated car where one is able to retreat to a private and controllable environment and equates this experience to the sonic bubble of listening to an MP3 player or iPod in public. So in Holy Motors then, the significance of the narrative structure for understanding my reading of the film, with Oscar moving around the city to various engagements that resemble cinematic modes and moments via limousine, lies in part in the mobility and flexibility of the automobile when compared to the ship as a mode of transport. When he's experiencing um, these moments out in the city, it's via car rather than via the collective stationary ship, as with the theatre. 
So, as I've said, Holy Motors extends cinema and other media into physical spatial zones that lie next to one another and can be traversed easily, that he can move back and forth with the car. All the representations of cinema and media experiences after the first sequence take place not in theatres, but out in locations around the city of Paris that Oscar travels to via his limousine. Much as mobile ubiquitous media enable us to travel between different media to move back and forth. As Carol Vernalis notes of contemporary digital cinema more generally, increasing segmentation reflects this experience of shuttling back and forth between different media clips on a single device. In Holy Motors, each segment appears to reflect a different mode or genre of film and or media. So in one extraordinary sequence, Oscar leads a band of accordion players around a dingy street lit with candles. The camera movement seems suddenly to be driven by the music. So as the music slows and fades, the camera um, movement becomes slower and the editing becomes slower. Um, so this is typical more of a music video, where as um, Vernalis says, the visual features are dependent on the qualities of the music. Um, in another, in another sequence, um, we, in other sequences, we begin to see not necessarily other media forms, but scenes that act as a synecdoche for a certain film genre or style, such as an action sequence or, memorably, the musical. Um, so this is an oddly uncanny musical number set in the theatrical, dilapidated, once ornate building of the Pont Neuf, which also has significance for Carrax, as he shot um, Les Amants de ah, there starring Kylie Minogue. Um, so as with the sequence resembling a music video, the formal properties of the sequence also replicate the visual conventions and tropes of the genre it represents. Kylie Minogue appears on the balcony, for example, and the camera kind of cranes up to her in time with the soaring music, alluding to sweeping cameras that accompany musical flourishes and film musicals like The Sound of Music and many, many others. Um, the camera movement, however, is quite stilted and jagged, suggesting a fading or disintegration of traditional si styles. Um, so I argue that what sets the stylistic choice apart from other kind of postmodern examples of self-reflexive sampling um, is the strong sense that these aspects of mediation are entwined with physical concrete space represented within the film. So there's a jarring contrast between the materiality of the physical grounded spaces, um, which are often in decay, and the levels of mediation intertwined with these spaces. Furthermore, the film emphasises the idea of a concrete car moving between physical spaces and thus implies a dynamic movement of both bodies and minds, um, which I would contrast strongly to films that invoke virtual, uh, virtual realities such as The Matrix where the bodies are in like a stationary pod while the minds are kind of wandering around. Although the style in which each sequence is shot mirrors the form or, of a genre or medium, we do not see this clearly mediated environment as contained within a screen or even a theatre. The screens that signify the boundary or framing between materiality and mediation are thus removed, implying a mingling between the two and an extension of media out into the physical city. This extension connotes the migration of media from contained sites of engagement into broader material spaces, where material experience is so entrenched in media that neither the cinema screen nor the camera should be apparent. In the thought-provoking final sequence of the film, a set of limousines, which have all carried around, Oscar, around actors like Oscar, talk together in the Holy Motors garage. Um, this is a fantastic sequence that just thoroughly confuses audiences, so it's always fun to watch the sequence with audiences. Um, one of the cars contemplates their future obsolescence, and another agrees that, quote, men don't want visible machines anymore, unquote. Instead, we want an environment where all interfaces are seamlessly integrated. Although the film is clearly a mediation on cinema, it comments equally on the broader relationship between mediation and space. Just as cinematic moments, archetypes and modes become spaces to be driven to within the urban landscape of Paris and Holy Motors, so too ubiquitous media connote a mixed layering, layering of mobile mediation within our physical experience. So to conclude, the relationship between space, perception and mediation is perpetually in flux as technologies continue to evolve. This shifting relationship generates thoughtful reflection, not only in critical discourse and in conferences like these, but also, as this paper has hopefully demonstrated, and my thesis will demonstrate, within the formal qualities of contemporary cinema. Thank you.